Right, so I'm, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff this morning because uh, the whole uh, discussion around nations, nationalism, national sensibilities has always been controversial. And uh, most of the literature I find on this subject is unusually weak, mainly because what they tend to do is they tend to confuse the particular manifestation of nationhood at a particular time with a kind of general conception that this is what a nation looks like. And quite, quite often when you read books on, on, na on, on nationalism or national identities, there tends to be a, a, a tendency to, to look at your own particular situation uh, in the way that nations and nationalities and national conflicts uh, manifest themselves and try to develop a theory around it so that the theories become uh, an attempt to almost uh, account for all forms of national sensibilities through some kind of uh, hierarchy or some kind of catalog of different forms of, of na nationalities. And one of the points I want to get, like to get across this morning, uh, in many ways, it, it's, it's to me is the most interesting point, is that uh, what a, a nation is, how a nation is perceived, how nationalism works at a particular time, is always historically specific. It's always contextual. And although we are always tempted to see uh, the, na uh, the, the rhetoric of nation and nationalism today as being merely the latest variant of what happened in the 1930s or the 19th or 18th century, they are very, very different. And it's, it seems to me to be quite illegitimate to continually try to compare or contrast or, or, or couple our nationalisms, our national sensibilities with things that have gone beforehand, you know, which is why I think uh, one needs to be, always be very careful when you hear people say, you know, nationalism in Italy is just like in the 1920s, or nationalism in Germany, it really reminds me, you know, of the, uh, of, of her, Herder in Germany, you know, sort of uh, writing about the German spirit. I think that's a very lazy way of understanding it, because one of the interesting things about nationalism is that nationalism has always been and always will be an incomplete ideology. It's not even an ideology. It's always an incomplete ideology, which is why the sense of nation always exists with something else. The nationalism of Republican France was very liberal. So it's a very liberal nationalism. The nationalism you know, of Germany in the uh, 19th century was very much linked to a particular cultural moment of romanticism, and it was very much shaped by that particular historical experience. And in many respects, what's also important to realize is that at every single stage, the way that na nationhood and, and sense of nationality manifests itself is usually a reaction to something that has gone on beforehand. In other words, you cannot understand 19th century German nationalism without understanding that it's reacting to France, the French Revolution. It's trying to isolate that French Revolution, trying to contrast itself to that. And similarly, when you look at East European nationalisms that have emerged at various points in time, they're always reacting to whatever has preceded it. And therefore, to simply see it as this kind of long story of more of the same, either it's radical or liberal or it's reactionary uh, manifestation, uh, fundamentally overlooks the fact that this is a context-specific Experience. And if you're going to understand our circumstances today, the way that national sensibilities work today, then you've got to understand the world of the 21st century, the cultural tensions and the cultural conflicts, the political conflicts that exist today, rather than simply take out a book on the nation uh, sort of, and you know, sort of leaf through it and ask the question, well, what does this remind me of? You know, what does it look like? You know, so, because that kind of zoological way of understanding social and cultural phenomenon uh, do doesn't uh, sort of really work. Now, in its classical form, um, nationalism is associated with the emergence of the middle classes, uh, what, what are often called the bourgeoisie, who, uh, in a sense, regarded nationalism as their own uh, political outlook, as a way of mobilizing the rest of society, principally to get rid of the ancien regimes, to get rid of the old order. So for, you know, in the 18th century, when nationalism begins to kick in, 
it is very much a middle class phenomenon. It's, they see it as a way of, of making sense of their world and at the same time of incorporating the, the people, you know, the masses, the, uh, the ordinary people into a common project. And it's very much uh, 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 that kind of a, uh, sort of process that we're seeing at that time. Uh, and in a sense, the appeal to nationhood has always had this kind of element to it. It's always been an attempt to expand the nature of solidarity. I mean, nationhood has always provided a very convenient medium through which solidarity could expand beyond the particular, beyond the regional, uh, and, 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 and gain some kind of political traction through that. Now, one of the questions you might be asking, and it's something that you know, is, is, is an important question, is whether nation-linked ideals and, and identities are reactionary, anti-modern, or progressive, or liberal. You know, you know, what is, uh, you know, where do we kind of fit in a nationhood-related ideas, national sensibilities, patriotism, national consciousness? And again, I think to answer that question, uh, you've got to look at the context. You've got to look at the context within which uh, the sense of nation manifests itself, the way in which uh, being a patriot uh, sort of comes, uh, comes to the fore and kind of kicks in. And it's interesting, I don't know if you... I was just listening to the opera Tosca, and you have you know, in Tosca this kind of uh, rebels against the Habsburg Empire in, in Italy, and they, they see themselves as being patriots. And when you look at the connotation that patriots had uh, sort of uh, within that opera, it very much was one of revolution, of rebellion, of liberalism. It was very much a, a universalistic-oriented ideology. That's the way they kind of perceived that. And it's something, uh, you know, when you listen to the opera, you know, you, would, you understand that the way they use the word patriot is very different than the way, for example, it's often used in the 21st century. It's, a, it's the same word. It's got very different meaning because the context is, is very different. And the circumstances ultimately uh, sort of determine this because what nationalism is, is almost, almost always influenced by the prevailing <laughs> economic, political, and cultural interests and cultural forces. So, for example, if you look at the writings of any 19th century philosopher, if you take Marx, for example, Marx himself takes a very different attitude to different types of nationalisms. I mean, Marx is known as being anti-national uh, and internationalist, but at the same time, when you read his books, uh, he, it, he kind of thinks that Polish nationalism is progressive. He thinks, for example, that Hungarian nationalism, Irish nationalism are progressive, because the context within which they emerge is, is, is one that uh, has a, an outcome that's got a liberating impulse behind it. That's the way he kind of perceives it. At the same time, he sees other kind of nationalisms as being regressive and, 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 and reactionary or backwards. So you know, whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't really matter. But what he's really trying to do, and I think that's probably the strength of his uh, argument, is that he's trying to find contextual explanations for each manifestations of nationhood, of nationalism, and national sensibilities. Um, so it is important to, to also remember that the reason why context is so important for understanding nationalisms is because nationalism and nationhood are, are ultimately subjective accomplishments. In other words, a nation is not born on a tree. It's not an act of nature that creates a, a, a national boundaries it's not an act of nature that creates uh, a sensibility of, of identifying with people who, who are like you, like you are. It's very much a, a cultural and a political and a subjective accomplishment. And this leads to a very interesting debate. One of the most interesting debates in the literature on nationhood is whether uh, the nationalist, was it the nationalist who invented the nation or is it the other way around? You know, in other words, what, which comes first, the nation or nationalism? And one of the arguments that Ernest Gellner puts forward, and, he, and his work is probably the most interesting in the most recent period because he takes a fairly wide view of the subject. What Gellner argues is that um, it's a very modernist argument. He basically insists that nationalism only became a historical possibility from the 18th century onwards. In other words, before the 18th century, what we call nationalism uh, didn't really exist. And he basically says, 
that nationalism is not the awakening of nations to self-consciousness. It invents nations where they do not exist, but it does need some pre-existing differentiating marks to work on, even if they are purely negative. And what Gellner is really getting at is that the sense of, uh, uh, the, sense of uh, the creation of a nation is to some extent an, in, an invention, uh, an imaginative process to kind of begin with, but you cannot just simply invent a nation as a fantasy. In other words, you know, you're kind of sitting around smoking dope, oh yeah, I'm going to create Germany here, or I'm going to create France. You can't really do that. What you need to have is you know, a language maybe, a certain cultural pre-existence pre, uh, uh, kind of pre beforehand, certain regional identities. You've got you, you to have something to work on before, uh, out of that, you create what then will become a nation. And, and there's a lot of historical examples in the way that this was kind of carried out over a, a period of time. So, for example, uh, you, you need to have some kind of cultural linguistic or, or, or some form of religious uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of pre-political uh, sort of institutions through which you then create this sense of nation or nation. Having said that, I, I myself tend to go along with Gellner. I, I think a lot of people argue the opposite. They argue that there's always been nations. You know, they will say that the Jews were a nation in biblical time, and they will point to different sort of pre-modern groups and ethnicities as, as being na the nations. I think that uh, that kind of confuses uh, matters a little bit, and I think that it, that's not a useful way of saying. I would say that the first time in history that you can begin to, you can begin to see in outline what a nation is and, and the sense of uh, national sensibility was in England, as it happens, in the 16th, uh, 17th century. And you know, it's, it's then that you first begin to have a discussion around the English people. And the English people had a kind of connotation to it that was more than just you know, sort of an arbitrary uh, sort of fact of life. It had a certain uh, resonance which will be interpreted, will be crystallized later on uh, as, as having to do with, with, with nationalities and, and, and nationness. So, what I want to suggest is that uh, the sense of the nation is a creation, both of intellectual and ideological advocacy, uh, and also of political and economic uh, interest. It's not just simply invented, but it, the imagination of a nation needs to draw on pre-political and political resources and interests. And I think the way out, as a sociologist in particular, I understand the emergence of nationhood and, uh, and, and national sensibilities is that it very much represents uh, a response to the need to accommodate to the widening of the public. I think in particular the, the main imperative behind the rise of, 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 of uh, uh, nationalism, nationhood, national sensibilities, the main imperative, as, as I, I understand it, is the importance of finding an institutional arrangement for managing popular uh, consent. And I think it's interesting that it's in those countries where the need to manage popular consent first emerges, first crystallizes, that, that, that the sense of nationhood really kicks in and becomes really important. I think I'm talking particularly about France, where the French Revolution uh, isn't just simply a revolution, it's a way of incorporating the French people into a common project uh, uh, in, in the 18th century. And I think this is a theme that will occur and reoccur time and time again. Where, and, and to that extent, I would also argue that nationhood and national consciousness can be used for good or bad to establish a relationship with the masses. I think that's generally how it begins to work and it begins to, uh, be, begins to uh, uh, kick in. Just as an aside, I think it's worth noting that the role of invention <coughs> sometimes will acquire far greater force amongst late starters. In other words, uh, countries and nationalities that are mimicking the nationalities that come beforehand are far more reliant on the imagination than people that preceded them. They, they have far less resources to draw on. So Jewish nationalism, although there were Jews since the beginning of time, has got to invent a new language you know, modern Hebrew, just like the Greeks will have to invent, you know, Greek all over again. And just like the Romanians will have to create this language that never existed beforehand in order to become 
a proper nation. And you'll find that as we go down through time, all the way to today, if you look at the Balkans today, where there used to be one language, Serb-Croat, you know, you, if you want to create a Croat nation and a Serb nation, you've got to create a, a Croat language that is almost self-consciously uh, sort of contrasting itself with Serb. And people tell me, you know, some of my friends in, in, in Dubrovnik and you know, places in the Balkans tell me that the language is changing year, every single year. The, the Croat language is becoming more and more unlike Serb with the passing of time. They can still understand each other, but it's widening because that's really the imperative, that's a kind of not imperative that of mimicking and reacting to each other that is kicking in and, and playing a, a, a very important role. I would argue then that whatever nationhood, national identity or nationalism means today, it's obviously not the, not the contemporary version of what has gone on there. Um, and I think that if you look at each uh, national movement, you'll find that the reactive element is really quite important there. The reaction of German particularism, the French liberalism and French universalism, the way in which East European countries react to what preceded it are, are, are all really quite important in this. Now today in the 21st century, we live in a very interesting times because there is a, a profound hostility towards nationalism. I think, you know, there is a, almost like a, a phobia against the word nationalism that you get in education, you get in universities, you get in the literature, where nationalism has become something that has, in a sense has never really been, this kind of xenophobic, reactionary, uh, sort of dangerous and destructive fo force. And that's really how it's kind of constructed in, in the contemporary discussion. And therefore, I think it's interesting to kind of take a step back and ask a question, something I've been struggling with. And I think that it's an unresolvable question. In fact, there are two unresolvable questions that we'll be discussing uh, uh, this weekend. One is the relationship between universalism and nationalism, the tension between the two, which you know, I, I want to talk about this morning. The other one is the unresolvable question between liberalism and democracy, where the two, you know, what is the relationship between the two? And I think we can resolve it for ourselves for our particular moment, but it's never going to go away. These are questions that will reoccur as long as human beings exist. It, it, they're the questions that have got to do with uh, the, the, the dynamic of, of, of modern life. So if you look at uh, universalism and nationalism, what is the, the relationship between the two? I find it quite interesting that there really isn't very much discussion, very many books on universalism. Uh, I've, I've been trying to you know, sort of find some stuff, because I wanted to write a chapter on the meaning of universalism. And I find that, the, in fact, the, the most interesting literature on universalism are written by religious people. Uh, and as an atheist, I always find it very difficult to you know, penetrate the language. But by and large, it tends to be you know, people who are of the Catholic or some of the Christian traditions who are still writing about universalism for obvious reasons, given their religious conviction. But in a, in a secular tradition, we tend to take universalism. If you're, if you're a pro-enlightenment person like myself, you tend to take universalism for granted rather than actually explore uh, sort of what it, it really means. But let's just look at universalism very quickly. If you look at it historically, it's implicit in Christian thought. Uh, St. Paul in particular has a lot to say about universalism uh, and the whole universal appeal of Christianity was obviously one of its most important selling points, universalism acquires its first genuine secular meaning in the Roman Empire, um, where the Roman Empire itself presented itself as a non-national universal empire where everybody could be a Roman citizen, regardless of your background or regardless of, of where you came from. Cicero, again, is very interesting in this because Cicero talks, talks quite a lot about the idea of universal law of nature. Cicero's and the, and the Roman ideal of universalism then is mimicked and in, in, almost in a caricatured way uh, about the claim that was made in medieval Europe by the Catholic Church that it was continuing the Roman tradition. You know, the Roman Church set itself up as the new equivalent of the Roman Empire and of Roman universalism and the Pope in particular claim universal authority 
and, and that the papacy itself set itself up as this universally oriented uh, kind of institution. It's interesting that at the time, in all the way to medieval Europe, universalism was the dominant uh, force. So that, for example, if you look at canon law, I mean, the canon law that the Catholic Church established explicitly attempts to maintain that universal claim. And if you look at the secular uh, princes and the secular kings, particularly in Germany, in the so-called Holy German Empire, they adopted Roman law. They kind of, uh, or at least what they called Roman law, as a way of legitimating and affirming that they too were uni 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 universalistic. But having said that, once you get beyond the medieval era, what you have is the gradual desacralization of universalism, where bit by bit you, you're getting to a historical shift from papal authority to that of the authority of, uh, of consent, the principle of consent. And I think that what happens uh, through a, a variety of different historical struggles is that as the papacy unravels, as you have the Reformation and the universal church uh, sort of split apart, where universal Christianity uh, will never repair that kind of uh, the, the damage that's created by, 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 by the by the, Protestant, by the new Protestant church and by the Reformation, so also coinciding with it, you have the emergence of the nation state where territorial, territorial claims of kings serve as an alternative focus for authority. And what you got at that point is, is the beginning of the breakdown of universalism as a legitimating principle for authority and its displacement by the authority of the nation state. This is done under the new monarchs and kings that are established at that particular time. In fact, if you can just uh, think back to the 14th, 15th century, what you've got is this mutually reinforcing process of religious rebellion, that's to say the Reformation occurring, but the Reformation succeeding ultimately, not just simply because of its theological uh, strength, but also because uh, of the breakup, of the, uh, the secular breakup of Europe into, into nationally and territorially based units. So two things go hand in hand. And I think it's at that point that in, in the European imagination, you have the beginnings of this tension in people's minds between the national and the universal. It's, it's really at that point that the two are seen often as being mutually incompatible as being somehow you know, sort of contradictory to one another. And today, of course, we have a very Philistine view of the relationship between the universal and the national, where you know, if you talk to people, they see the two as opposite. Nationalism is there, internationalism is there. We're universalistic. You know, you're, you, you've got this kind of patriotic nonsense that you're talking about. The two are seen as being uh, sort of uh, almost like a kind of Opposites, of, of opposites, rigidly opposite to each other. There's no mediation between these two uh, kind of particular elements. <coughs> and of course, what's interesting, uh, this is something that these theories uh, do not understand, is that when you have the establishment of nationness in the, you know, in the 16th, 17th century, as Benedict Anderson said, they become the most universal, legitimate value in the political life of our time. In other words, the call to belong to a nation, national self-determination, the right to be part of the, you know, your people, becomes this universally accepted medium to which people uh, sort of perceive their role in this world as citizens of a particular country under the authority of a particular state. Now, I would argue that, in a sense, universalism and nationalism, or sense of nation, are mutu can be mutually reinforcing uh, sort of dynamics and are historically inextricably linked to each other. We're not aware of that because of what has happened in the 1920s and the 1930s, but that's the way that it works, because historically, as you will recall from your readings, yeah, and this is something that everybody agrees on, even those people who will see the nationhood today as being unacceptable. Everybody agrees 
that historically nationalism was the major force through which democratic consciousness expressed itself in the modern world. In other words, national was the medium through which democracy came alive in the 18th century. Uh, that, uh, national became the medium through which the people and the rights of the people uh, sort of were seen as being uh, uh, really sort of quite important. Any of you who are interested in this, I would suggest you should read a book by Hans Kohn, K-O-H-N. Uh, it's a very big book. You know, I, I usually use it to work out because it's quite heavy, you know, sort of. Uh, but it's really worth reading, not because it's absolutely right, because there are some, you know, he's reading 1944. In 1944, if you're writing a book on, you know, sort of on nationhood, you are going to have the Nazis and their shadow hanging over you. You're not going to feel very comfortable talking about the subject. But nevertheless, he goes back to the beginning, and it's a really rich text uh, to kind of look at. And in... And in the book, he basically says that nationalism not only prepared the ground for mass participation in politics, but in this way, he says, also contributed to the development of the idea of universal values. Uh, that's what he says in his book, The Idea of Nationalism. He goes on to say, nationalism, as we understand it, is not older than the second half of the 18th century. Its first great manifestation was the French Revolution, which gave the new movement an increased dynamic force. And in a sense, what he is trying to do is that he's linking the nationalism of the 18th century, its universalistic aspirations. I'm not here if it's for me, by the way. I'm, uh, he's, trying to, he's trying to link that uh, to the philosophy of Greutus and Locke. Uh, and I think that it, it, it's really quite important to kind of remember that there is uh, that kind of linkage. Uh, all, obviously, what happens is that as nationalism in its universalistic form emerges in the 18th century, many of the reactions to it will acquire a particularist form. And I think it's very interesting that it's in Germany, of all places, that particularism acquires a very powerful philosophical and cultural expression. It's not surprising, because in Germany what you had was uh, instead of there being a, a nation and national institutions with its own state, you have a fragmented Germany at that point in time. And the only thing that could unite the German intellectuals was this, uh, you know, th this kind of zeitgeist of, of the German spirit. If you look at Herder, he's trying to invent this kind of unique soul uh, that defined, although Herder himself was still fairly universalistic in, in, in many respects, uh, you still have this kind of attempt to kind of uh, sort of create this what Volksgeist, uh, and which is manifested in literature, in folklore, uh, in mother tongue, and in history. So it's this kind of romantic uh, uh, sort of nationalism that kind of emerges uh, at that uh, stage in time. And I think what's interesting about Cohn, he's very anti-nationalist by 1944, because it, you know, being a Jew fleeing Germany, you're going to have some reservations about some of its manifestations. <laughs> Uh, obviously, but what's interesting about Cohn is he nevertheless still understands, because he's got a very good grasp of history, the subtle interaction between universalism and the sense of, of nationhood. And he even goes, uh, I think he goes too far when he says, before antiquity drew to a close, Jewish as well as Greek thought developed an attitude of universalism and humanism which left behind it all differences of race and national civilizations, and which hailed man as part of humanity whensoever he came. And he goes on and concludes, it is significant that in antiquity, only two nationally conscious people developed a conscious cosmopolitanism and universalism. That's basic. I think it's going a little bit too far, because Jewish people also had this idea of being the chosen people, you know, which is, you know, was always there. But nevertheless, if you look at the writings, you know, Maimonides and other Jewish philosophers, you will find there's a kind of humanist element to that, that they kind of combine, I think, under the influence of the Greeks. I think the Greeks are principally re responsible for that, for influencing a, a more universalistic, and uh, not in a modern sense, kind of uh, orientation. <clears throat> it's in Germany that you have the beginnings of this, uh, what we see as an anti-enlightenment, particularistic, uh, romantic notion uh, 
uh, where nationalism in Germany got two particularly uh, negative characteristics to it, which is it's both anti-rationalistic, anti-rational, and sees reason as being somehow uh, a kind of a, a negative destructive force, and it's also against autonomy, individual autonomy. Uh, and it's got that kind of, um, what would become this kind of, uh, you know, sort of provincial conservative sentiment uh, that it attaches to the way that uh, the sense of nationhood kind of, kind of occurs. Okay, now if we just jump forward to the, how much time have I got left roughly? <coughs> All right, all right, all right, okay. So, jump forward to the 20th century. And I think the 20th century is overwhelmed by uh, national, or what we think is nationalism. Uh, and very often what happens in, 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 in the European context is that uh, all the troubles, all the upheavals that follow First World War, that lead to the First World War, the emergence of what's called totalitarianism, the dark period of the 30s and the 40s, all those horrible events are very often linked to nationalism. Whereas, in fact, if you look at the problem deeply, you will find that, uh, you know, to understand the rise of Nazism, the Nazism isn't the extension of German na nationalism. In other words, you know, there's this kind of slippery slope idea, a continuum where you begin with patriotism, that's cool, that's okay, you think nationalism, that's a bit disturbing. You get to be heavy nationalist, and that's horrible. And then below, you know, below hold and low, next morning you're a Nazi. Right? That's a simpleton's version of history. Because, in fact, if you, if you look at the way that uh, the German Nazi moment emerges, it's, it continually emerges out of profound social and economic struggles, where the German ruling class felt totally out of control by the upheavals of the First World War, the overthrow of the Ancien Regime, you know, the Kaiser. You had a, a major you know, revolution breaking out in Germany, which could only be crushed and could only be defeated by mobilizing uh, some of the people that would become the brown shirts and the black shirts later on. And very much you have also kind of you know, a finely balanced you know, sort of social situation between the left and the right, within which you had uh, the spiraling out of control of these kind of uh, fascistic kind of tendencies. So there's a, there's a, a moment at which you have a, a breakdown of social and political order, which then throws up movements that are very much the creation of that moment. I mean, I've read books where German Nazism, these are people who kind of you know, see it as being inevitable, they link it to Luther. You know, there's a book, you know, series of books written which basically say, that if you read Luther's writings on the peasant revolution, and they weren't very pleasant. I mean, Luther was not a nice guy. You know, when it came to you know, sort of hanging and destroying and killing the peasants in a revolution, Luther is like Adolf Hitler without the mustache. You know, it's kind of very much seen as just you know, sort of a, the beginning of a gradual process that kind of gradually kind of leads to that. And I think that kind of history has stayed you know, very much with us. But the point I really want to make about this is that what happens is that as you have this fear of nationalism, you know, when you actually scratch the surface, very often the fear of nationalism that emerges in the interwar period is actually the fear of democracy. It's actually the fear of what will people do? Who will they vote for? What kind of governments do people really want? In particular, it reflects the estrangements of the European political elite and the political establishment from the, from the people of, of Europe. And it's at that point that for the first time, the literature on nationalism acquires a consciously anti-democratic form, where increasingly what, what basically Nazi people say, people will say, oh yeah, nationalism used to be good in, in France in the 18th century. It was really good in the 18th century, nice liberal nationalism there. And American nationalism you know, was all right because they had you know, kind of all this uh, uh, First Amendment you know, sort of and various kind of legal protection. But today what we have uh, is a problem where people in general uh, tend to be, you know, sort of uh, extremely irrational, xenophobic racists. So, for example, if you read the book by Carlton Hayes called The Historical Evolution of Modern Nationalism, he makes the point that uh, 
you know, sort of, uh, that, that even under liberal governments, the masses tend to be increasingly chauvinistic. Uh, and you have this, uh, what I think is a very classic book written in 1945 by Albert Coburn called National Self-Determination. And he is really writing a book for the Foreign Office at that particular time. He explains it this way. He says, nationalism is the parent of totalitarianism. One is bound to conclude that liberty and national independence are not necessarily the same thing. And the latter is not the supreme political good. Nationalism and totalitarianism are the immediate problem because they are largely responsible for the intensification of the political struggle. And certainly, it is necessary to take the sting out of nationality by disassociating it from sovereignty. So he's saying some very important points here. And, and already this, this point is made in the 1930s, where basically what you're trying to do is to separate nationalism or nationality or even patriotism from sovereignty. You want to have a sovereignty that's no longer based on national aspirations. Right? I mean, the EU will become one version of that, but there are a number of other ways in which you denationalize sovereignty so that you know, national aspirations have a much more of a limited uh, kind, of, kind of role uh, sort of, uh, that they acquire. I would argue, and I'm going to discuss this a little bit more tomorrow, is that the call to denationalize sovereignty, that's to say to separate the national from the sovereign, also works to denude sovereignty of, of democratic uh, sort of content. And I think that by depriving nationalist politics of much of its legitimacy, we have created a situation where the, the world of nations it necessarily becomes more and more complicated. Now, in, in the present moment, especially since the Cold War, there are a lot of alarmist accounts about the discovery of nationalism. A lot of stories about how nationalism is becoming strong again, far stronger than ever before. I think that these accounts are fundamentally flawed. I mean, I travel around Europe quite a bit. I mean, I'm, I'm Hungarian, and Hungarian nationalism is meant to be the worst in the world. I go to Hungary, and Hungarians are so nationalistic that they're just kind of leaving Hungary to get <laughs> jobs, you know, without a blink of an eye, you know, sort of. I mean, their patriotism, you know, sort of is not able to resist, you know, the appeal of working in a hamburger restaurant in London, right? So I think that there's, there, there, there are qualifications to it. People talk about the revival of English nationalism. I think that English nationalism is, is very thin, very superficial, very embarrassing. People are, you know, people, you know, people who are nationalistic in England, you can tell how, how unimportant they are by their kind of caricatured way in which they kind of conduct themselves. They're kind of, you know, almost, uh, almost like kind of, you've got to have this flag in front of your house to, to indicate that you're okay. Otherwise, if you haven't got the flag, you're, you know, who, how would you know that you're a nationalist? You know, they're, they're, you know, I, I think that when you look at France and all these different European countries, we find that what's really interesting about them is not so much the strengthening of nationalism, but the, the, what I call the diminishing scale of loyalties, the, the weakening of, of the bonds that used to exist. And I think that there's a kind of uh, fragility to the rhetoric of nationalism within the European context. And the only time that nationalism has any uh, sort of presence is, in, a, is a, in reacting against the European Union. The European Union acts as a conduit through which occasionally, from time to time, here and there, people's sense of, of nationhood uh, becomes much more, uh, much more significant and much more important. And even in the Balkans, where people talked about the, the rise of nationalism, the Serbs, the Croats, and the Bosnians, I think what you'll find there is not nationalism, because Yugoslav nationalism didn't last very long, but the rise of ethnicity and re regionalism. And I think if anything is strong, it's a reaction to nationalism in many, many parts of Europe. You talk about Catalan, you know, you know, you know, what's called Catalan nationalism, but Catalan nationalism is regionalism that's reacting to the, to the Spanish nation. That Scottish nationalism, whatever you want to call it, you know, is reacting to the, the, the nationalism of, the, of, of Britain. And therefore, what you really are, really are seeing here are kind of reactions to the nationalism. In fact, what's very interesting in our time is that nationalism is being hit from two sides, well, from three sides. One is the cosmopolitan EU kind of nationhood is being very bad and very negative. 
Then there is a regionalism within the nation, which basically calls into question prevailing uh, national sensibilities and national identities. And finally, by the rise of identity politics, you know, where you, it's your identity that becomes really quite important, you know, your gender, your race, your ethnicity, or whatever, rather than anything else. So the, you know, all those identities become far more meaningful uh, in terms of contemporary culture uh, than this apparent powerful uh, sense of nationhood and, and nationalism. I think that uh, the logic of what I'm really trying to say is that, uh, in many respects, conscious anti-nationalism, uh, as it's kind of expressed in uh, prevailing political culture, tends to be uh, really quite important. And in particular, its attempt to denationalize cultural life. And I think that's a very uh, important development. So what are my views on, on national consciousness and the nation? I write as somebody who's got no strong national sentiment since I'm nobody, you know, I'm not English, I'm not Hungarian anymore, I've, you know, I, I lived in many places. I don't even know what passport I've got at, at the moment in time, you know, sort of, or, or whatever. Uh, but I nevertheless think that national consciousness is important and it needs to be harnessed to a, an enlightened version of a political community that recognizes that uh, the people, the public needs to be drawn into political life and in particular, the reason why nationhood is important is because it's the only medium through which solidarity uh, can have any genuine meaning. And in particular, nationhood is important because nationhood is the only medium through which the idea of citizenship can really kick in. I'm really uh, worried that in our political debates, we never talk about what it means to be a citizen. You know, sort of what's a citizen? And, and what role do we assign to a citizen? Because I take the old Republican, not American Republican, but the old Roman Republican or the uh, city-state Republican ideal of the active citizen being the best guarantor of a democratic life. Now, it just so happens that you cannot be an active citizen in the abstract. You can, be, you can only be an active citizen uh, in, within certain territorial context. You can only play the role of a, of a citizen um, uh, if you are bounded to some extent to some physical space. Uh, you cannot just simply be a citizen in the abstract that just kind of floats around here and there. Democracy involves responsibility and commitment. It involves that you are responsible for the decisions that are arrived at. You're responsible for the well-being of your fellow citizen. And that usually is acquired and can only exist within the context of some kind of uh, territorial boundedness. In his classic study, Anderson stated, in an age when it's so common for progressive cosmopolitan intellectuals to insist on the near pathological character of nationalism, its roots in fear and hatred of the other, and its affinities with racism, it is useful to remind ourselves that nations inspire love, and our profoundly self-sacrificing love. And it seems to me uh, that the nation and the, and the sense of nationhood is, is the precondition for solidarity. Now, here we come to a, a very difficult question because a lot of people who think the way that I do argue that what we need is a civic sense of nation as opposed to an ethnic sense of nation. That's usually been the the way that this problem has been understood. Civic sense of nation is okay, an ethnic one is bad because it's very uh, sort of exclusive, it kind of keeps people out, it's, it's very much bounded by, you know, sort of biology and genetics and all the rest of that. And I think that that kind of division does exist in, in, in many, many quarters. But the way I, I look at it, and this is the problem that I'm kind of struggling with at the moment, is this. Obviously, we need a, a, nas a sense of nationhood and a political space, a territorial space within which we exercise democracy that's civically based. In other words, where loyalties and commitments and rights and privileges are based upon civic, secular, rationally uh, worked out criterion based on the rule of law. The problem is, and this is something that Hannah Arendt 
uh, in, her, in her writings, the, the, the political philosopher Hara Arendt, in her writings, talks about time and time again. The problem is, is that it's very difficult, but in fact it's impossible, to have a genuine form of solidarity that's entirely based upon procedure, that's entirely based upon the law, upon civic commitments. Right? What she's really getting at is that for there to be, you know, people, if, if people are going to commit to each other, if they're going to be genuinely bonded with each other, you need something more than a rule book. You need some kind of intergenerational linkages. You need some kind of what, what she calls pre-political cultural resources that you draw on, a common language, you know, a common sphere of practices, some, some kind of ways in which your family, your children, your ancestors have some kind of meaning for you. And even if you have a totally modernist version of civic forms of nationhood, the very fact that you, you are you know, sort of creating a nation, creating a, a, a common uh, space for solidarity, presupposes that there is something that pre-political that you draw on. Now, historically, there's been two examples where that has occurred relatively successfully. One is the Roman Empire, where the Romans drew a common commitment on, their, on, on, on the founding, on the founding of Rome, on the myth of, of Rome, you know, the wolves and you know, the Aeneid the and all the rest of that, as being the origins of Rome, and, and that becomes like this founding myth. I'm not, a, I'm not into myths all that much myself, being a 21st century person, but that's really what they were doing. They were providing a, a, a relatively civic basis, you know, sort of, that was also pre-political, as a, as, a, as a foundation for solid, very successfully. I mean, the Roman Empire, whatever you think of it, you know, whatever the, the Romans did for us, it was a relatively successful kind of operation. And the other example that's quite similar to that is the United States. You know, where the United States also had its own founding. I mean, the founding fathers, you can still use that expression. You know, sort of uh, the, the founding fathers and the establishment of the Constitution you know, sort of, uh, and, and the, whole, the whole moment of founding formed a very important uh, sort of uh, kind of foundation on which political life and, the, and cultural life you know, evolved pretty successfully for a, a relatively long period of time. You know, maybe not now, but it, it just shows you that that is not a, uh, an entirely you know, sort of idealistic and entirely fantasy-like kind of perception. And naturally, seems to me to be the, the challenge of, of, of ensuring that you know, solidarity uh, has that kind of aspect to it. Final point, just to get back to universalism, what is very interesting today, and this is my takeaway message uh, for you, is that in, in the 21st century, it's not just nationalism that's pathologized as being bad, but also universalism. Right? And I think that's very interesting, because if you look at the, the cultural temper of our times, you know, universalism is seen as being almost as bad as nationalism because of its uh, uh, kind of aspirations for a common human soul. And, you know, what we have today is a situation where the principle, the dominant cultural uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, force in our time, which is that of identity politics, equally pathologizes both national identity. It's the one identity you cannot have. You can have every single other identity, but it's also very scathing of universalism because what universalism does to identity politics is it destroys it. I mean, because universalism basically says that regardless of whether you're gay or straight or this or that, you know, we're all human beings, and that's, that's what counts. That's what's really quite important. So I think it's not an accident that both nationalism and universalism have got such bad press in the 21st century and, it's, and, and that bad press, I think, is something that we need to combat and, and question uh, and, and, and put forward a much more modernist, future-oriented way of making sense of these things. Thanks.